and welcome to irishracing.com my name is Emma Nagel and for this week's video I'm heading to the Irish National Stud in County Kildare so I'm here with Cahill Beal CEO of the Irish National Stud Cahill it's not just a breeding operation here there's a lot of moving moving parts every day a lot of moving parts yeah I suppose like fundamentally it's the stallion business it's the stud business uh, we have uh, 350 mares foal here every year we have boarding clients uh, 12 months of the year and obviously we have a stallion business with lucky vega invincible spirit phoenix of spain etc and we cover you know five or six hundred mares every year with the stallion business and then we have the tourism side of the business so it's all about letting people come in and see what goes on in the industry um and come and see mares and foals come and see our living legends see the stallions and then the gardens is another uh, attraction and a draw as well as the irish racehorse experience so something for everybody and what's it like managing kind of a commercial operation like the breeding and the stallion unit with the tourism side? Yeah, it's a, it's it's a challenge, but it's a good challenge. You know, it's um it's it's great in a sense from a purely commercial perspective. As we all know, farming is a sort of a once in the year you get paid pursuit. Uh, so from a purely cash flow point of view, tourism is great, obviously, because people are coming in. You know, eleven months of the year. Uh, so on the commercial side, it it complements each other very well. We have gardens, we have studs. And even from the horse perspective, you know, mares and foals, being around people all the time, it actually helps them by the time they get to the sales or get to the racetrack. They're used to a little bit of hustle and bustle and uh, they're used to people and they're happy to see people. So it's, um, you know, it, it's a complimentary thing, I think. I'm sure they enjoy the attention from all the tourists. Um, and this, there's a, obviously a deep history to the stud here. Can you just run me through that a small bit? Yeah, I mean, like the stud was sort of purchased by William Hall Walker in 1900 and from 1900 until 1916, he was a very successful breeder, probably the most successful breeder in Europe at that time, bred seven classic winners in, in those, you know, 16 years, um, including Minaru, who, who won the Epsom Derby in the colours of King Edward VII, Prince Palatine, who won a couple of, you know, a ledger and a couple of gold cups. So some really incredible horses for that time. And in 1916, he decided he would gift the entire farm and all the mares and foals, which was the equivalent of the um, the Judmont or the Coolmore, Coolmore broodmare band of the time to the state. So he created the National Stud in 1916. And really, it, it remained as the National Stud until 1945, where uh, there was a decision made where the UK would get all the stock but the land was owned by Ireland. So the Irish National Stud Company was set up in 1946 and Royal Charger was the first stallion who was purchased for the Irish National Stud Company and he became a very successful stallion and I suppose we've, we've gone from there. And then, you know, taking us into the present day, we've developed tourism, we've developed education, we've developed, you know, we've got the, um, the Irish Equine Innovation Centre uh, we've got a lot of other uh, strings to our bow now as the, as the company has evolved over the last 80 years. So David, thanks very much for speaking to me here. Can you tell me a bit about the Irish Racehorse experience? Well, we'll walk around and I'll show you, but basically, as you know, for years, people have been coming to the stud farm and seeing how horses are bred in the breeding industry. So we've just built this amazing uh, exhibition which takes people through the entire life of a horse from uh, uh, from foal to yearlings to uh, uh, sales to training to jockeys and then we have a simulator to show you how you've all done. So it's been open for a few years now, what's the feedback been like from the public? Actually it's been amazing, I mean we built it for not what, what we call the 95%, the people who are curious but not necessarily involved in the industry, but what's really impressed us is the 5%, the real enthusiasts, the really people involved in the industry have come in walked out with a smile on their face going, we've nailed it, we've really shown the passion and the excitement of the industry. Let's go have a look around. So, so as we walk through, this is where the video plays of, uh, of, of the industry, right from the, the original Arab racehorses that come in uh, up to some exciting race meetings. It gets people uh, in, into the action. The next room is all about the thoroughbred meeting, meet, meeting the, uh, the, 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 the average horse, so the, the, the start of the thoroughbred. And this is very much what we're all about here. We have a young foal that's just been born. We have meeting the stallion, a bit on scanning, different sort of scan photographs. And Joe then 
who was at one of our foley managers, tells uh, about, about, uh, about the process that he goes through. As we come then in towards the next room, this is the last stage, of course, that they're on the stud farm. We do a bit on corrective uh, full feet management. And over there, Harry talks people through about preparing yearlings. This is the first simulator, if you like, coming into Goffs. And the horse goes, the horse is going round, and this is where you can see on the screen the horse going round, and you can choose your horse to buy, and uh, and and you can buy that. So as we come into this room, having bought, we've bought a chestnut filly, and we come in here, we can learn more about the industry, and this is where the, my computer is asking me to pick a name. I'm going to choose Magic Fight and then we go along. This is probably one of my favorite. It's a really informative piece where you can learn about tendons, hooves, limbs, respiratory, heart speed. You press one of these buttons and the video behind tells you all about the, uh, the, the bit that you want to learn. And as we come in here, we have their lung capacity, different heart sizes. If you pick a heart up, you can hear a heartbeat going from naught to 240 beats a minute. We tell people about the uh, scoping a, a horse and you can actually scope and see the result there. And this is where it gets interesting on your iPad. So we've given it a name, we've bought the filly, we've given her a name. So now we're gonna choose a pretend trainer. And this is the winning or losing on it. You can do, there's lots of options from beach gallops, treadmill, pampering, short sprints. Where the computer works it out is we're only going for seven furlongs in NACE. So if you choose lots of acceleration like short sprints, starting stalls, etc., maybe a race course gallop, you start training your horse and we're building up information. This is Jessie Harrington's yard. She talks about her career, but also if you press a button, you can t learn about certain things like, uh, like the schooling strip. And uh, she talks you through the uh, uh, parts, of, parts of our operation. Now we've done trainers, now we're doing jockeys. This is the interview over here with Johnny Murta talking to Dr. McGoldrick about some of the health issues. We have a very good screen here, which takes you through, talks you all about flat jockeys and the food they might be able to eat or not eat, as the fellow would say, and jumps, jump, jumps and, the, and some of the, 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 the terrible injuries that they might have. You can go through Ruby McCoy, uh, Ruby, Walsh, AP, press AP, and um, you get all his information. We have uh, showed them some saddles. We, we got it, weighing scales people can look at, some props. And then we head in, but before we head in, we can choose the colors. So we choose, we're gonna choose colors. So now our computer has all the information we need. Magic Fight, Chestnut Philly, and the colors there that we've chosen. As we come in here, Robert Hall tells us all about what he, might, what he thinks is a, 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 good, a good spot in the paddock. We talk about the going from firm to heavy. There's a bit, uh, a, a small piece there on the betting industry. And uh, here we understand the race card, all the difficult, different things on the race card. In here, in here we have uh, a commentary box. It's the famous ro race of Dawn Run, winning the, um, the, the Cheltenham Gold Cup. But we can have great fun because you can switch the screen on and play karaoke and record yourself uh, doing the commentary. And this is where it gets interesting. We go in, you can see this is the horse we've chosen, Magic Fight, coming in, and then we go into the big race. And Magic Fight's name comes up on the screen, and we have the eight horses that people can race. And then the final room, it's overlooking the, uh, the, the, the paddocks. Over here we have the living legends. In another hour or two, they'll be moved into this paddock here for the general public to see. 
There's a review here of your race. That will have a, a video of the race that's come up. And here we have interviews with, with um, some of our past students. And then some of the jobs in the industry. And then finally, John, John Osborne talks about uh, the thoroughbred aftercare and the welfare of, 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 of animals and the great push to, um, to find jobs for them after, after they left the industry. So thanks for speaking to me here, Connor. You're here a few years, you were telling me you're a graduate of the, of the breeding course? Yeah, I did the course in 2019 and I thankfully stayed on here since. Uh, it's been a, been a great couple of years here and looking forward to many more, but um, I suppose the roster at the moment, we have Invincible Spirit still at the top. He's been here for 20 years. Uh, but, you know, there's some nice young stallions coming along now in Phoenix to Spain, who has his first runners this year. We're hoping that he can keep, his, uh, keep the good start that he's made going. He's already had two winners from just four runners. So we're very hopeful that, you know, himself and Lucky Vega and even Nando Parado there, they all have a good chance of being a, a success at Stud. And it's getting a bit quieter here now. You've, after a, a busy few weeks, you were telling me, um, what's it like kind of dealing with the stallions day to day? What's their routine like? Yeah. Here we're very much in the impression that they, they should be out, out, out as much as they can and um, you know if they're not covering in the morning the first thing they do is they, they get turned out to their paddock it's you know we find out that that, that that can be great for their heads mentally and um, yeah they're, they're getting to the end of the season now but uh, yeah they've had a busy couple of months and they're getting a couple of months rest now thank god but Lucky Vega is actually heading back to Australia at the end of June so there's no rest for him unfortunately. <laughs> and how many mares would you typically see coming to visit your stallions every year? Yeah, look, I suppose here at the stud, we kind of have them priced that we're hopefully that each stallion is covering 150 mares. Uh, that doesn't work out in a lot of, a lot of time. But uh, yeah, look, I suppose 150 is a good number. We feel commercially for breeders to send a foal to the sales, it's a, it's a good number to be competing against. Um, you know, some, you see some stallions nowadays covering 220, 230 mares. And, you know, there's a lot of competition at the foal sales for breeders that use stallions at 15, 20 grand. Um, yeah, look, I suppose this year we've covered seven or eight hundred mares and, you know, you'd obviously like that number to be more, but we're, um, we're still continuing to grow that. This is Lucky Vega. He's a son of the great Lope de Vega. He's quite popular here at Stud. He's standing in his second season now here at the Stud. Yeah, he covered 150 mares last year in his first book. He's set to cover a similar number this year. And you're happy with how his foals are looking? We've some lovely first falls on the ground by him here. Yeah, the the first book contained forty black type producers, thirty stakes winners. Um, it was a book of very high quality, and we're seeing that in his first falls. They're you know great bodied animals with great movers, and they seem to have great temperaments like himself. So we're very excited to see how his first falls will go down now at the breeding stock sales at the end of this year. His owners, Yulong Investments, have supported him very strongly and we're hoping that he can become leading first season sire but hopefully leading second season sire as well with the quality of mares he's covered in his second season. So the next out here is Phoenix to Spain. Yeah this is another son of Lope de Vega. Uh, we were lucky to uh, acquire him in his two-year-old season when just after he was second in the race and post trophy to Magna Grecia. He landed the Irish Guineas on his reappearance at three in impressive style, beating two Darren Hot and Magna Grecia. And he's into his fourth season now here at the Stud. He's got his first two rows running this year. He's already had two impressive winners, uh, both won by six lengths. So we're hopeful that they can turn up at Royal Ascot now as well. And he's, um, yeah, he's getting plenty of mares off the back of his early success with his runners. He's a lovely moving horse, uh, probably a different sort of shape to Lucky Vega. He's that bit bigger, and but uh, again, he's got a great temperament, and we're hopeful that he can he can hopefully keep his keep the good start that he's made going and get a couple of black type winners in the back end of the season. Would you get enjoyment out of following his craft going to the legs of Royal Ascot now? Would you be watching them closely? Yeah, there's going to be great excitement at the farm. I guess he's kind of the latest horse that we've been able to buy into it as a two-year-old and watch him race on a tree. Um, and uh, yeah, look, it was a great day for the farm when he, when he won at the Curra that day. And again, if, it's, if, if one of his progeny turn up at Royal Ascot and, and can and perform well there, it'll be a great excitement at the farm here. So next up here is Nando Parado. 
Just, yeah, Nando Parado, his son of Kodiak. Um, you know, he won the Coventry Stakes on his second start at Royal Ascot, got a two. Twice Group 1 placed in France as a two-year-old as well. He was a very sharp two-year-old, the second highest rated two-year-old that stood by Kodiak in Ireland. Um, he's a very good looking horse. He was 165,000 guinea purchased by Master Pinnocker Paul McCartan. And we have some very nice foals by him on the ground here at the stud this year. He covered 135 mares last year in his first book. And off the back of his very good first foals, we're seeing a lot of people return to him this year. He's going to cover close to 90 to 100 mares this year. And, you know, Sons of Kodiak have performed well at stud so far. Ardad, Cody Bear, Coolsty all tasting success. And it was nice to see Cody Bear and Ardad sire black type horses in their, from their second crop as well. Um, bodes well for Nando Parado. Invincible Spirit's obviously been the flag bearer for the stud for quite a while now. What's it like working with, with a horse of his calibre? Yeah, he's left his mark on the breed globally. You know, he's he stood a couple of seasons in Australia and he's even left the champion sire down there and I am Invincible. Uh, you know, he's established him, as himself as one of the leading sires of sires in the world uh, with Kingman in the Northern Hemisphere and as I mentioned there, I am Invincible in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, you know, he had very humble beginnings here. He, he stood his first year here at 5,000 euros. Uh, and in his peak in 2019, he was standing for 120,000. He's been a great servant to the farm, sire of 22 Group 1 winners, 138 black type winners, I think, as well. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's been great to have him around for so long, and hopefully we have him around for another couple of years. That's perfect. Okay, so I'm here with Anne at the National Stud. Anne, you kind of preside over the students on the course? Yes, so the Turbo Breeding Management course, which was first established in 1971, is the world's most renowned equine program. And to date, we have over 1,500 graduates spread across 31 countries across the globe. And it's, I suppose, the unique part of the course is the practical hands-on experience that the students gain while they're here in the course. So the course starts in January each year and continues throughout the breeding season and ends with their graduation in June. And each day the students will rotate around the different areas of the stud farm, gaining lots of practical hands-on experience, working in the foaling unit, the mares and foals, and with our stallions as well. And then the practical training is complemented with a series of evening lectures, which are delivered by industry experts. So they get a great overview of the industry itself. And the course is obviously renowned worldwide. I've met a few international students here. It's kind of a mix of international and Irish on the course here. Yeah, it's a good blend of of students here they come from all over the world and they all learn from each other as well and they make friendships and connections for life which is very good for them you know when they're furthering their careers in the industry and what would typically what would a student go on to do after the course i know there's a lot of famous alumni that have gone through here during the years yes yeah, so our own ceo cottle beale has done the course uh, in the 2006 and he's gone on to you know being a great advocate for the course and they go into different areas of you know the industry some will go on to manage stud farms some will go in to you know the bloodstock area of it you know and into the auction houses and some will go on into media as well so there's lots of opportunities and there's lots of opportunities for them to travel this year a lot of our students have got the opportunity to travel to Australia which is great opportunity for them and they also travel to uh, the USA as well. So there'll be a few names to look out for among this course I'm sure. Definitely a few names to look out for. So Anne Lee thanks for speaking to me Um, tell me a bit about yourself and why you came to the course here. Hi everyone so yeah I'm Anne Lee I'm from Germany I grew up at my parents stud farm back home and I decided to do the course especially because I wanted to get more foaling experience and the national stud folds around 400 males um, and I thought that's a great place to be. I also had friends who have done the course in the last few years and they recommended it really highly to me. Um, yeah, so I came here to get a foiling experience. I met a great bunch of people who I know they will always be talking to in the future. Um, I also got to handle stallions that I've never done before. Yeah, plenty of reasons to do the course. <laughs> and when you finish up here, what are you hoping to do once you graduate? What are your kind of longer term goals? So straight after graduation, I will be going back home to Germany. Um, 
we'll prep our own earlings back home and we will be going to the sales in mainly in Germany and I would like to start my own breaking and free training um, yard in Germany um, but I would also like to be at all the sales in Ireland and England and try and buy and sell a bit more. I'm really interested in everything from four to two year old uh, so probably try and do a bit of pin hooking, breed with our mares at home and try and get German racing more on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we'll, we'll definitely hear of you, hear, hear of you in the future. Um, what's your favourite thing about the course here? Is there a favourite foaling or anything that you've, you've had? Uh, I was really lucky. I followed Queen of Carthage a few days ago. Um, so I followed a half sister to our stallion Lucky Vega. She was a gorgeous filly by Gaias and I'm definitely going to follow her in the future. Brilliant. Thanks very much. So, Will, you're a student here at the National Stud. Tell me a bit about yourself and your own background. Uh, so, I grew up in Australia, um, just on a sheep and cattle station an hour north of Scone in the Hunter Valley. Um, so, I didn't grow up on a racing kind of uh, farm or anything like that, but um, I've always ridden, I've always um, I've been around horses from a young age, so um, it was kind of, uh, it kind of came quite naturally to me when I, when I started to get into my racing. And what made you apply to the National Stud course here in Ireland? Um, well, firstly, I wanted to, to learn more um, and kind of progress my career. It's, um, it's a course that comes highly uh, touted by bloodstock agents, trainers and stud owners in Australia. Um, you know, everybody who you meet either knows somebody who's done the course or who's been on their course themselves. So, um, yeah, no, it was just an obvious choice. And what's your favourite aspect of the whole thing? Um, I think just the balance between working and learning as well, what kind of differentiates just uh, this to a normal stud job, is just getting to learn um, every different aspect, getting involved in every different aspect from foaling to stallions, uh, mares and foals, uh, yeah, so it's great. And in a couple of years time, where do you see yourself? What's your, what's your kind of longer term aspirations? Um, well, I'm lucky enough um, to be uh, taking on uh, the Goffs internship um, following this course for six months um, and I'd love to continue some work for the sales companies for the next couple of years um, just kind of learning the ins and outs of that part of the industry um, putting on sales um, and doing the best for, for clients Brilliant, thanks very much So Emma, Cork woman here on the National Stud course tell me a bit about yourself and your own background with horses Yeah, no bother So predominantly from Cork but we'd have a National Hunt background um, I was lucky enough to be involved in the breeding of last year's uh, Grand National winner Noble Yates, um, so we bred him from our little family stud at home near Mallow. Um, so that kind of got the the wave going for me, we'll say. So after that then I followed on and I decided to apply for this course. So I'm delighted to be here now and, and getting to learn more and more about it. it must have been some kick journey at Grand National. We know you went over to see it as well, did you? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we were there for the day, so it was class. Um, we were inside with the winner's enclosure getting our picture and everything, so it was definitely the best day of my life so far. <laughs> Hopefully we'll have more to come. <laughs> a day to remember and yeah. you're here in the National Stud now and what's your favourite part about the course? Um, oh it's, I couldn't pick one part, it's so varied like everything, like we get such good experience between, between foaling and working with stallions, working, trying to get mares back and foal afterwards, it's just it's so varied and then like the group of people that I'm working with are you know they're one in a million like you couldn't meet such nicer people anywhere so it's great just to make the connections and you know we'll always have have a good group of friends coming out of it and where do you see yourself in a few years time after graduation oh that's a tough question i think i'd like to maybe stay in the line of, of stud managing or something like that maybe sales um at the minute i'm not leaning towards working in a racing yard just because i'm loving the stud work so much so hopefully we'll, we'll stay in this line um i'm planning on going to australia soon after this course get some more experience down there and see how they do it down under and yeah hopefully go from there brilliant thanks emma no bother. so scott you're from scotland and you're looking after farheen here what's it like looking after such a great horse ah oh, it's brilliant he's such a great race horse he was one of the horses that got me into racing and now I've been working on it for the last few years, so it's great to be able to look after them now. And what kind of character is he in the field? He's, he's on a fair few pounds by looks of Yeah, he, <laughs> he has indeed, but <laughs> no, he's grand in the field. He's, he just gets on, has a peck of grass, likes his food. And, yeah. and loves all the attention. He does indeed. He's always up at the rail when the tourists are here. He loves the attention, loves getting a good old pat. When you're here, another student of the course. How are you finding it? Legends like yeah, it's brilliant. Uh, favorite part of the course is definitely working with these lads. They're all gentlemen, and they love love their attention and feed. So uh, 
this horse actually got me into racing. Um, my mum used to treat him when he was in racing in uh, Michael Horrigan's, so I used to go down with her uh, some days, and I remember seeing him win the Lexus Chase in Leopardstown, probably one of my earliest memories. And yeah, followed him all the way through, and it's great that I'm able to spend time with him here again when he's at the ripe old age of 27, so it's brilliant. Welcome for full soccer for you, so. Yeah, exactly. And what do you want to do after the course? Is racing kind of your main Yeah, part? definitely racing and bloodstock sales as well, yeah. Breed a few, hopefully, and uh, sell, sell a few in the flat, please God. And uh, yeah, so it'll be something in the... What's your own role here? What do, what, what do you do day to day? Well, I work in the Kildare Yard. It's one of the biggest mare and foal yards in the National Stud. And um, we have about 80 mares and foals go through it this year. Um, and I just look after the mares and foals, come in in the morning and feed everything, make sure everything's okay. And then my students will come in and we'll tease, um, tease the mares and betting. That's, that's the main part of the day. And then obviously looking after all the horses is the, the main job. And what's your favorite part of your job? Working with the mares and foals. I just, I love watching them grow and, and yeah, watching them progress, I suppose. And I suppose especially that lady's progeny herself, Vega, she's a very special one to have in the air to you, I'd say. She really is. She's she's an absolute pleasure to work with and she's just really kind and lovely in every aspect. And when she came here first, was it, like when you get a, a mare who is so prolific in racing, is it hard to get them to settle into the new lifestyle? She took to it very well, actually, and took to motherhood very well. Um, and it's, it's very unusual for such a good horse like her to be so good on the track and then come and be like an even better broodmare, especially with Facile Vega and stuff. So yeah, we're very lucky. She's she's fabulous. She's an asset to the place. So she's kind of a sweet character to deal with. There's no there's no, not much hassle with her. No, she's very, very calm and collected. And we've a little full brother of Facile Vega next to us. Paddy Vega, I think you were calling him born oh, in St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Paddy Vega, we just call him Paddy for short. And would you take a lot of pride in seeing the likes of Cecil Vega running and winning on the track, knowing that he came through here his whole life? Oh, absolutely, sure. It's, it's fabulous to watch him watch him go and to think that I was looking after him here back in 2017 when he was that size, you know? It's real job satisfaction, I it suppose. It is, it's great. So I'm here with Stan who runs the INS Racing Club. Stan, can you give me a bit of an overview overview into the club itself? Yeah, so uh, INS Racing is a racing club here at the Na at Irish National Stud. We have um, five horses in training um, and it, we've opened to the uh, public where we limit it to 50 members. Um, at a cost of 1,000 euro, uh, people um, uh, can, I suppose, get a chance to race uh, top class horses in a cost effective way. Um, we have so our five horse in training are which are trainers Jessica Harrington, Willie McCree, Johnny Murtha, uh, Ross O'Sullivan um, and um, we have one there in pre-training at the moment. And for a thousand euro it's massive access into different yards and different see different horses. Um, what is kind of what, what are the kind of the perks of joining the club? You get, do you get to visit the yards when the horses are in training? Yeah, exactly. So it gives people the opportunity, I suppose, um, they get to follow the horse along, they get to name it, and um, to watch it on the racetrack, and then um, we they get the obviously the opportunity to, to visit all these trainers' yards throughout the year and see how the horses are progressing. And um, how have the horses done so far? Is anyone of note? Ah, uh, so I suppose our flagship horse was is Blazing Skies, who last year uh, won her maiden very impressively at Goran Park, and she has been uh, running well in. Um, uh, black type races so far and we had another horse last week, uh, Hope and Innocence, who was fourth on her uh, first run back so it should be kind of an exciting year with her too. So here in the Legends Field now we've got how to use this car to employ the first salmon and mighty Faheen. Fiona, you take care of the Legends here. Tell you a bit about our daily routine. Um, well, in the morning time they come into this uh, paddock front of Tully it's called. Um, so they can meet all their fans here along by the rails. Uh, so they get spoilt with carrots and apples with them. And I feed them first thing in the morning and then they're here all day up to six o'clock uh, and so the tourists really love getting up close and personal to them and giving them pats and stuff so uh, it's great and they really enjoy that and then come evening time uh, at six o'clock they go out to a bigger field out the back where they chill out and lie down and go to sleep 
and they get a, another little bite. And does it take them long when they come here after races? Does it take long to settle into them or to date life? Uh, no, they didn't actually. The, I mean, the hurricane, um, when he arrived, we thought this is going to be interesting, but uh, it worked out very well. He settled in well uh, with Beef for Salmon because uh, he's the, sort of the leader in the pack. And um, he really got on well with everyone and, and, and loved the tourists as well. He sort of took his mind off racing. So, and he loves the people, uh, as they all do. So he settled in really well. Um, so our new recruit was uh, Faheen there a couple of years ago and he slotted in great as well. Now he's put back in his box fairly quickly um, by beef or salmon, so, um, but uh, he's slotted in well now. Maybe a bit of hustling and bustling for the so field. There was, there was, but uh, King Beefy here uh, <laughs> gave them an old talk or two. <laughs> and do you have your own favourites among them? Uh, beefy. Uh, listen, I love them all, but sure, listen, he's probably here the longest and my first one to look after, so uh, he would be my favourite anyway. But I love them all. Stephen, you're based here in the Innovation Hub at the National Studs. Can you tell me a bit about your products? Yeah, so this is Trojan Track. Basically, we're an app on a smartphone. All you have to do is put your smartphone on a, on a tripod, walk the horse five metres away from the camera, and we'll pick up 52 points on your horse. Now, what we could do with these points is we could get joint angles, joint velocities, the correlation between one joint versus another joint as they're working and we'll compare this to the horse's healthy baseline movement. So from this, we could check early signs of lameness, any imbalances that are creeping into their, their walk while they're training. And that means the trainers then are able to just get a better kind of in-depth knowledge into, are we training this horse through an injury? Is he going all right? Should we pull him from training? And get the vet involved as well. Brilliant. And is your target market, is it trainers or sales or a bit of everything? So at the moment we're targeting trainers because one big thing now in training is the horses get injured and we want to keep the horse as injury free as possible. So we're targeting the trainers, making sure they're on top of any injury that they have. But then down the line we'll be looking at sales as well. So analysing the walk in the sales ring, seeing how does it compare to their sire, how does it compare to previous progeny that have performed well. So we'll be doing that down the line as well. And it's still developing at the moment. When are you hoping to launch? Yeah, so we're still in development. There's only two of us on the team now at the moment. So we're hoping to hire a few guys over the summer now to build the tech a bit better. And we're hoping to launch around the end of this year. So we'll be launching probably in the Ireland and the UK first and then going to Australia, uh, US and Japan. It's quite a new concept. I don't think I've heard of it being done in Ireland anyway, at least. Yeah, so uh, I discovered the technology when I was in college there two years ago. So I'm kind of new to this, this whole scene as well. But um, I think it's, it is coming into uh, it. It is coming into um, horse racing a lot. Like you see Tom Wilson in the UK, and there's Byron Rogers in the US doing similar with sales. So I think you'll probably be seeing a lot more of similar tech now in the next couple of years. Great, thanks very much. Hi, I'm Jennifer Corley. I'm one of the founders of Equitrace. Equitrace is a secure medical record linked to a horse's um, microchip. So at the stroke of a microchip scanner, there you go, you can access a secure medical record that will have all the details that the staff need to manage this, whole, this foal's health. Equitrace is a complete medical record for horses which can be kept at the side of the horse securely on your mobile phone. The horse industry has been one of the last to really adopt technology. 75% of farms are still using pen and paper based records. And even on farms that have kind of management software, um, it still means that personnel don't know what's going on. It's hard for them to communicate without long WhatsApps. Treatments are written up on boards and that leads to a lot of human error. All of that data has to get back to a laptop in an office. And that can mean that there, there are problems, that records aren't complete or they're not accessible to vets where they really need them. Equitrace is very secure. Um, the minute that data is entered, it is securely encrypted and sent to the cloud then whoever is authorised can draw that information down at the side of the horse where it's needed. There's nowhere busier than stud farms in the middle of breeding season. Um, with foals arriving, particularly if you have problems like a disease outbreak, it can be really difficult to keep track of medications and horses and what's going on. With Equitrace, all the staff have to do is scan the animal and then they can see what that animal needs to get. They scan the medication with the phone, it will recognise that medication, you know that you've got the right horse, right medication, and everything is, is securely recorded. And then the whole team know that that animal has been treated. So there's loads of benefits, obviously, to stud yards. Is it, is it being used in other equine disciplines outside of just stud work? 
Yeah, um, so Equitrace is unusual. It's been co-founded by two veterinarians, myself and my husband, Dr. Kevin Corley. His major expertise is around medication. Um, we know there's lots of problems with recording medication and it's becoming more and more important to do so. Equitrace is approved by the IHRB and it can be used instead of the Blue Book. One of the problems with Blue Book is keeping staff able to get it filled in, getting people to fill it in. Um, with Equitrace, it's so sim simple, it's so quick. So you can just use it without the scanner, put in a few name, few letters of the name, call up the horse. Then to add a medication, all you have to do is take your, your iPhone camera, point it at the barcode of the medication, and it'll recognize over a thousand medications automatically. Um, that means it's accurate, that means everything gets recorded. As I say, the records are held securely on the cloud. When it comes time to report to the IHRB or in the event of an inspection, you can just draw down your data and you have everything complete, complete up-to-date and accurate. Um, this is really important in Ireland. We know that regulations here are tough. So I'm here with Anne from Troella. Anne, can you tell me a bit about um, yourselves? How, when did you get started and what do you do? Yeah, I'm a, I'm, well, I'm Anna O'Connor and I'm the executive officer at Troella. So Troella was founded in 2020 by Sarah Sands and Quiva Doherty with the support of Godolphin. Um, it was, we're a not-for-profit organisation and we're basically set up to find opportunities for racehorses in their second career um, and also for thoroughbreds that just didn't show talent on the race course. Uh, our mission is threefold, so we connect racehorse owners, breeders and trainers with retrainers or people who feel they can give the horses a second career. And secondly, then we promote these uh, people with their horses through training clinics, which are sponsored this year by Randox, and also by a sponsored schedule of events in different disciplines for the horses. So you're based here on the Innovation Hub in the Irish Nationalist, so it's obviously a great location for an organisation like yourselves with the legends behind us we can see enjoying their second career and how are you um, funded, how are you supported to do your work? Well we're very fortunate that we get great industry support um, for the work that we do, I mean it's never been more relevant now, the aftercare of racehorses, so we get support through and funding through HRI, IEBF, um, Godolphin as I've mentioned already, um, major stud farms and corporates. So for example, we have Moidler Stud sponsoring uh, parades, we have Randox sponsoring our training clinics, we have Tattersalls on board sponsoring a Showing Pathway series. Now again, it's never been more evident as it is annually at our Christmas show, which is basically our celebrity show jumping classic. This year it's happening on the 14th of September, where everybody comes together, all industry bodies come together to sponsor classes and to sponsor different aspects of that show which highlights uh, the versatility of the thoroughbred in a sport horse career. So the versatility of the thoroughbred is kind of key to your kind of core values as an organisation. Can and you are, are you involved in the retraining process yourselves? No, so Emma, what we actually do is we, we don't practically take in the horses and physically retrain them. So we're an information centre. Um, we pass out information to owners, we advise owners, trainers, breeders, what the options are on their third, for their thoroughbreds and then we align with retrainers or we, we pass on numbers so that we can connect, connect them with people who can retrain them. The thoroughbreds, they're very quick learners, they're agile, they're, they're very dis diverse second careers. So for example, we have the eventing. So there's 21 thoroughbreds entered this weekend for eventing alone. Show jumping, showing is very popular uh, with them as well. Um, and also uh, the polo. Polo is big for thoroughbreds now. They want the Irish thoroughbred. It's their, their agility. It's how they retrain so quickly and how sturdy they are. In more recent times, we've seen them um, pop up in Pony Club. So teenagers, big area now for thoroughbreds within the Pony Club, within Riding Club, but also within inter-school. So that's very positive to see that. And, and also I've come across thoroughbreds within education. So I came across Briar Hill, a Cheltenham winner, recently in uh, Grenon College. So he's educating the future riders and of course the race uh, establishment 
they have full team of thoroughbreds to train our future jockeys. And the other, I think, important part is, and it just shows the level that a thoroughbred can go to. We've had two thoroughbreds that have been part of a pilot scheme for therapy with horses, and they both are now accredited therapy horses. They passed all the criteria that was involved, so that is particularly positive. So obviously an extremely intelligent animal. And the owners of these horses must get great satisfaction when you enable them to um, connect with a second career, in a way. This is, this is a very positive, I think, aspect of it. Um, it's amazing the number of thoroughbreds that are still owned by the people who race them. And they have a great interest in following the horse, see where it's going, what it's up to. Um, and the trainers. The trainers really do enjoy meeting up with the old uh, stable mates um, and seeing how they're progressing and how they've adjusted to the new career. It's lovely hearing the stories from the stable staff as to what they like during training and they love seeing them in the second career progressing and enjoying their new life.